school back in the 90s, I went by Weld's Pond. Um, I was a member of the hacker group Loft. Uh, we named ourselves after the space we were in, which uh, was a old manufacturing building that had been converted to sort of an artist's and uh, you know, clothing designer kind of space. And we ended up taking over a, a, hat, a, hat, a hat studio. Um, and uh, in true hacker form of the 90s, we spelled it L0PHT. And we called ourselves The Loft, because that's, that's, that, that was the physical space we were in. We, we, we uh, had a physical space because back when we started in 92, you know, there really wasn't an internet. Um, we weren't at a university. We wanted to have a lab environment where we could set up a network. We'd have shared machines that we could attack and, and do our security research. And we needed a physical space to do that back then. Um, if we were going to share equipment. Um, and I don't know how many of you did research back in the mid-90s, but there was this thing called computer manuals that were like on a shelf. And you know, for VMS, you had to have you know, 10, foot, 10 feet of shelf space for all those orange manuals. So having access to hardware and, and computer manuals was a lot more difficult back then. So we actually uh, did this as a, this was not our full-time job. Uh, we did this as a, uh, a hobby. Um, and we did this outside of work. And we, you know, we, we, paid, we paid the rent. And we, um, we tried to scrounge up equipment in sort of corporate cast-offs, dumpster diving at the companies in, uh, around uh, Boston and Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, MIT was all a good spot to get old equipment from. So um, we started doing security research uh, on Windows sort of in the mid-90s. And um, that, that was kind of what I, I specialized on. Some of us did Linux. Some of us did Windows. Um, and so uh, eventually we came across um, Windows passwords. And that's, that's where Loftcrack came from. That's what I'm going to talk about the history today. It's hard for me to believe that um, I uh, wrote this program with two of my uh, one of my colleagues 18 years ago. And I'm still talking about it now. But it's amazing how long problems persist um, and, are, and, are still, and are still relevant. So um, I saw this sign last night coming back from the pub. And I don't know really what it means, but I figured I had to put it in my presentation because <laughs> cracking is very important, right? Um, so I uh, just wanted to give a shout out to some of the people that uh, influenced me. I don't think we do this enough on the sort of hacker security researcher side like academia does um, because we all learn from each other. And a lot of times we don't mention uh, because we, we're not formal with our uh, references and things like that. So um, I wanted to call out some of the people that were pretty influential to me. Um, uh, you've probably heard of Dan Farmer and Weetzi Venema, who wrote this really uh, great paper in 91, 92, which was securing your network by breaking into it. And that really set me on a path of, of, of how I was going to pursue um, security and taking that to securing passwords by breaking them. And now my career, uh, I founded a company called Vericode, which is about application security, securing applications by breaking into them. Right? So it's not about security features. right? It's about what's the actual implementation, um, what's the ground truth, what's the reality. And you know, uh, Tian Farmer and Weetzi's Venema uh, paper really helped crystallize that for me. And if you haven't read it, definitely you want to check that out. Um, another uh, important paper, especially for Loftcrack, was this paper by Hobbit. Um, I don't know how many people have heard of Hobbit. He wrote the tool called Netcat um, in the mid-90s, which I then ported to Windows because I was like, hey, I want to explore ports and I want to put back doors on Windows, right? So I ported it to Windows, um, which wasn't easy because Windows version of TCP IP was a big mess. Um, but he wrote Netcat, which was really a seminal tool for network exploration on Windows. And uh, he wrote this paper uh, CIFS on CIFS, which was the Common Internet File System, which is the name that Microsoft was kind of proposing to the IETF um, to standardize on you know, a file sharing system for Windows uh, for, for the internet. 
and it ended up just being called SMB over time. Uh, but you know, he, he, he called it common insecurities fail scrutiny because he started poking at it and found it was a big, it was a big mess. And um, some of his research and the modifications he did to SMB client for Linux to basically uh, research uh, at the SMB protocol was some of the early, early stuff that I learned um, to look at uh, the challenge response protocol on um, early Windows, which was completely, completely broken um, back in the Windows 95. And then, of course, Windows NT was, was, uh, was backwards compatible. Um, and, of course, I have to mention Dan Farmer's PWC, which was really the earliest password cracker. Um, uh, Dan Farmer famously got fired a few years later um, from Silicon Graphics for writing a program called Satan, which was the first vulnerability scanner. And that was one of the reasons that we used hacker names uh, back then. And we released our tools anonymously or pseudo-anonymously because we didn't want to get fired from our day jobs. I was working at BBN at the time, which was a company in Cambridge, Massachusetts, which helped build the original backbone uh, of the internet um, in the United States. And uh, we did security for that. And um, we didn't want to get fired because we saw what happened to Dan. Here are guys that are writing password cracking tools, and they're the ones securing uh, you know, the internet backbone. Uh, we, we, we thought that might not go over very well. Um, we eventually got outed, but it was later. It was around 98, and things were a little bit more sane. But really, in the early to mid-90s, you didn't want to be called a hacker and have a security job. So the origins of Loftcrack, really the, the key inspiration for Loftcrack was uh, when Jeremy Allison, uh, creator of Samba, um, released PW Dump. And his inspiration for doing this reverse engineering work was, uh, you know, he wanted to be compatible between Linux and Windows NT. Um, so he wanted to see, you know, where are those hashes? How are those hashes stored? How do you generate those hashes so that I can generate them on Linux. And uh, so he, he came up with PW Dump that uh, did that. Now, he wasn't doing it from a security perspective. He was doing it from an interoperability perspective. But when he published this on March 24th, right away, the, the mailing list went on fire saying, oh my god, this is just a horrible, horrible uh, mechanism for, for, for storing hashes. This is completely, completely broken. Windows is completely broken. And within, you can see here, within four days, Jonathan Wilkins writes a, writes a, uh, a cracker for, um, for the Landman um, hash. And we were working on it at the time, too. And we're like, damn, he released before us. So we're like, well, we have to, to one-up that. We have to crack the NTLM hash, too. Right? And now, of course, with the NTLM hash, you can, you can log in on the console. Um, because you can't do that with Landman, you can only do that over the network. So definitely that was cool. And one of the, one of the um, um, that we really released it as a proof of concept. The, uh, the proof of concept was um, Windows is broken. You know, that was, that was our whole, that was the whole ethos back then was you release a tool to prove that uh, something, something didn't, didn't work. Because if you didn't do that, then no one would, believe you. Microsoft would say that was theoretical. We actually came up with the, the tagline for the loft. We had it on our home page, making, making the theoretical practical. Because we figured if everyone just called all the attacks theoretical, they didn't have to fix them, right? Because theoretically, someone might attack it. But if it was practical and everyone could download the tool, then they would fix it. And that was some, one of the early the early, some of the early ethos of why you had to create proof of concepts, why you had to distribute exploits um, to get anything fixed. And I've learned over the years that the, unless the customers of the product, the people paying money to the vendor, unless they, they can actually run the exploit, see that it works, and then go to the vendor and saying, what are you gonna do about it? Nothing actually gets fixed. Um, and that's really what happened um, uh, with Loftcrack, although it, it, it took them a while, it took them a while to, um, to, to, to fix it. So just the, NT, the Windows NT password hash refresher for, for, for you that don't know. Um, 
essentially they stored the landman hash and the NTLM hash um, per user in the registry. So they stored these two hashes of the password together, um, but one was incredibly weak. Right? One was they split it into two halves, seven long. So if your password was seven long, you got you know, a null for the second half, or if it was eight, you got one character password for the second half and seven for one. Um, they used no salt and they used single des um, to, to, to hash it. So even on a Pentium 133, which is sort of the, the, the machine that you could buy back then for a reason that wasn't outrageous amounts of money, you could go into any store and buy it we could cycle through the whole alphanumeric key space in, in, in um, I think it was in two and a half days on a penny of 133. So we're like, well, that's pretty, that's pretty broken. Of course, dictionary attacks were, you know, minutes. Um, and uh, and uh, Microsoft, of course, when we actually were to started talking about this to them and the claims they made, they claimed that their passwords would take uh, years to crack. They would take years to crack because they were thinking of the uh, the the NTLM password, which was you know 14 characters, not uppercased, um, and uh, and used uh, I believe it was RC4. Well, it's been a long time, uh, and uh, um, they they made they, they made these claims that 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 was the strength, and it really goes back down to you have to do the reverse engineering work. You have to see what the facts are. You know, you cannot take any vendor claims because they make mistakes. You know, when I look at software and I assess software, of course I do threat modeling, of course I talk to the engineers, I ask them, you know, what's the design, where are the data flows, what are your inputs to the program, what do you do with that data? But then I always inspect it, right? I always inspect it. What files does it open? What shared memory does it use? What name pipes does it create? What sockets does it open? Because oftentimes the developers don't know. Right, they're calling a function at a high level and some other activities happening at a low level that they don't understand. So this is, a, this is exactly a case of Microsoft not knowing how their password scheme actually, actually worked. Um, the, uh, the other really sad thing about this is uh, this scheme actually persisted for 10 years. Um, it was the default scheme. Uh, all the way up until Windows Vista in 2007. So for 10 years, um, after this design flaw was, was, uh, was brought to light, um, Microsoft, they, they did some sort of quick patch, which I'll talk about, but the actual design flaw persisted for, for, for 10 years, which is just completely crazy. So it shows you when you make these design decisions and you want to have backwards compatibility, how long this stuff persists into the future. So it's really important to get it right. So this was Loft Crack 1.0. Um, Mudge, uh, my colleague uh, at the Loft, wrote uh, the command line version and wrote the, uh, the, the core cracking algorithm. And I said, you know what? Why don't I write a, a GUI version? This is for Windows, it's not for Linux. This is gonna be so many more people who don't understand how to run command line tools that if we can say, click here to you know, load, load your uh, password hashes and click here to crack them, we're gonna, we're gonna actually hit a whole nother market of system administrators and users um, to, uh, to understand the problem. And I think that's, an, I think that's an actually pretty important. When, we, when you come out with exploits that are super hard to do, um, that are command line only, um, it, uh, it, it limits the exposure, especially to the customers who are the ones that are gonna actually make the difference to affect the change, to force the vendors to do something. So whenever you see uh, a tool and we deride them as script kitty tools, we see SQL map and it's a script kitty tool, makes it easy for anyone to hack SQL in a website. Um, the guy who hacked TalkTalk Talk probably used something like that. You know, uh, those are important. You know, I don't deride script, script kitty tools because they give exposure of the vulnerabilities that if it was really hard to do, um, uh, they, it would be less likely to get fixed. Um, so our first version of 1.0, it, all it did was crack and imported uh, the PW dump format. And then um, a little over a month later, Microsoft responded with their essentially security theater patch, which was, um, they called it syskey. And basically all they did was add some obfuscation to the registry where these were stored. And of course it just took um, 
a few more months for people to deobfuscate that and be able to dump the passwords hashes again. Um, and then they didn't do anything else to fix it, right? I think later they added a registry key where you could stop adding, uh, you could stop storing the landman hashes, but it wasn't that way by default. We all know that default security is what everyone uses. So around, after the response we got from 1.0, um, we started to say, you know, it wasn't just a proof of concept tool that we're showing, hey, look, Microsoft is broken. You should tell Microsoft to fix their stuff. Um, we started seeing that, you know, pen testers were using this and system administrators were using this to say, hey, I want to secure my system. It isn't just about telling Microsoft, well, I'm sure they told Microsoft that they should fix their stuff, but since they didn't, um, Lovecraft took on a life as a tool to secure systems, to point out weak passwords and understand what passwords were strong and what passwords uh, were, were weak. And we saw system administrators start to force users to do uh, password resets when they used weak passwords. And this was before there was any security uh, password quality checking, which was later added. Um, but, but even then you want to, you know, we all know that you can use the rules that the password quality is enforcing to narrow, narrow the key space. Um, so we started down this path at this point to saying, hey, maybe, maybe we should be focusing on helping pen testers and system administrators. It's not just a proof of concept. So we came out with um, 1.5 um, a few months later, and this is where we started to say, hey, this, it started to become a script kitty tool, to be honest, right? Let's have some ease of use. Let's not make them use PW dump. Let's build a PW dump functionality in so we can then, you know, have a menu item, dump the passwords from the local registry. Um, we also had done research on the whole challenge response pro network protocol. And if you captured that data with, uh, with a packet sniffer, we would then, um, we, we could then crack the landman uh, challenge response protocol. So we added that in. And then we said, hey, you know, system administrators are using it. We heard people at the government were using this. We should be charging them for this, right? They, they should be paying for our research. So, because uh, we're doing this on our own dime. And uh, so we, we, we created a shareware license. I don't know how many people are old enough to understand shareware. But shareware was, you know, sort of like asking for a donation now. It actually was in the license. It said, like, if you use this after so many days, you need to uh, send, send, send some money, right? So it wasn't, it was, it, now people ask for donations. Shareware was actually in the license, but there was no enforcement, right? So it, it, it didn't really work. We actually only got paid for a handful of, a handful of licenses while we were shareware. And the first shareware customer was the US government accounting office. So it was kind of fun to be like, hey, the government's using our, our tool to audit the rest of the federal government. Um, so then with, uh, but the shareware thing wasn't working. So about, you know, a little over six months later, we said, all right, let's, let's you know, let's put in a actually license, licensing mechanism where you need a key to run the software. Um, and all of a sudden when we did that, hundreds of people started paying for it. And then thousands of people started paying for it. So having the enforcement there really turned it into a commercial product. Uh, we built in, um, built in cha uh, challenge response sniffing to make it even easier. You didn't have to even understand how to use a, um, uh, like the, you know, a uh, PCAP tool or something like that to dump the packets. You just chose from the menu, start sniffing the network and um, it, would, it would do that. Um, and then we, uh, in, we created the SAM dunk functionality which allowed you to get at the hashes through uh, the SAM file which you could um, get from an emergency repair disk if you can remember that back in the day or you could boot, you could boot uh, NT with Linux and just grab the SAM file um, that way. So we're, we're going down a path of just making this the turnkey easy, easy thing to do. Um, Dildog, who now is really the main author of, of Loftcrack, um, joined in 99 um, full time. So now Loftcrack is actually, we're sort of bootstrapping here. He's, it, it, the, the license fees are actually enough to pay him um, his, sa his salary. And um, he wrote the, the DES core algorithm 
Um, he did some really cool stuff um, making sure that the inner loop of the brute forcing um, was uh, all fit in the L1 um, cache of the, uh, of the Pentium chip at the time. And um, it, was, it, was, it, was pretty, it was pretty fast for the time. And then we started adding in other, other techniques that we had seen people talking about. We call it hybrid, where you, know, you, take, you take your word list and then you permute you know, characters, tacking things on the end, on the prepending, appending, um, to follow the patterns that, that uh, people used for, for creating, uh, creating passwords. And then something happened which would, you know, kind of put, put Lovecraft down a different path. Lovecraft actually over the 18 years has uh, been owned by five different organizations. So you probably didn't know that. Um, so uh, Loft, we, uh, we had grown to about nine people. We started calling ourselves Loft Heavy Industries. Uh, we had been doing a lot of security research. And uh, in 2000, um, we were trying to figure out how do we how do, how do we you know, turn this into a full-time job for anybody, everybody? Do we need funding to do that? You know, Loftcrack isn't quite enough money to, to bootstrap us. And we're trying to figure that out. And we ended up making the decision to basically get bought by uh, this company called At Stake, which was a VC-backed, fledgling um, security consulting company. And, and the Loft was going to be, uh, re the, be the research lab, um, building tools, doing the research, and then the consultants would go out in the field and, 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 and do that. Um, At Stake wasn't interested in any of our tools or technology. They actually were scared that we had a password cracker. They're like, no, we don't want to buy that. So basically, it was a bulk hire, and they bought the brand name. They bought Loft, so they could say, hey, we, brought, we bought the Loft. And by doing that, they made it so that we couldn't have our Loft website anymore. And I don't think we thought about it at the time, but we couldn't sell something called Loftcrack uh, anymore because they had bought our brand. So uh, in hindsight, I don't know if that was the best deal, but um, it, seemed, it seemed good at the time. It was the frothy.com right before the crash, right? Um, and so we had this version of Loftcrack ready to go. Uh, we were calling it Loftcrack 3. Um, UI was super simple. There was like a wizard where you could just click, 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 you know, dump, crack, report. Um, you could, you could, you could, um, it was just su super easy to use. Um, and we added re remote registry importing. So you could, if you had authentication credentials to a, uh, a domain controller or another machine, you could actually, rem uh, it would send over an agent, dump the hashes, and pull them back over the network. So super easy to audit any machine that was network reachable that you had, you had credentials for. Um, but we, we weren't able to release it uh, because it had the loft, uh, the, the, loft, the loft name. So we, we got distracted starting at, uh, at, at, uh, at, at At Stake for a while. And it took us another almost a, a year here. But we basically created another entity called Security Software Technologies, and we renamed it LC3. So I don't know if you've seen it named LC345, but uh, we, we, we had to change the name to get rid of the LC, and that's, that's where that came from. We also added distributed cracking at the time, so you could run across multiple, uh, multiple uh, hosts, and it would, um, it would uh, coordinate. coordinate coordinate uh, splitting up the key space and uh, cracking over, over multiple, uh, multiple machines. And then when, after we renamed it LC3 and sales were bigger than ever, all of a sudden that stake started to get interested in it. Um, we had, I guess we had sanitized the word loft and we had sanitized the word crack and now it was LC3. It was this password auditing and recovery tool. And At Stake approached us and said, um, "Would you? We 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 want to buy that, buy and distribute that that tool um, from you." And I think it was all the At Stake's corporate customers were being, "You got the Loft guys there. Can I buy? Can I buy Loft Crack from you?" Um, so um, this was sort of mistake number two. We ended up selling it to At Stake. So now this is the third entity that that owns it. But there's a happy ending. It's a happy ending. Um, so 
you know, now it has, now we actually add stakes like, okay, we'll invest in uh, some more professional, you know, marketing, and we have a product manager. So you get a product manager, of course, you have to have three different versions, right? Professional, administrative, and, and, and consultant. Um, and professional, I think, allows you to crack up to 1,000 users. Ad, admin um, was mostly unlimited, but we didn't really support over 10,000. And then consultant was sort of a traveling license where it wasn't, it wasn't node locked. And we started, and we actually had professional support, um, person answer the phone. And then we started adding more people, and we came up with LC4. Uh, Rob Shane uh, joined the team, um, and uh, just, just general improvements. But you can see now that we're starting to get sanitized here. We're kind of losing our, 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 our dark hacker, cool graphics, and it just looks like another uh, corporate tool. And around this time, if I had to be on, honest, we're sort of losing our edge here, right? We're not on the forefront of coming up with new features that no other cracking tools have. It, it's, it's, sort of, it's sort of lagging. And I think this is sort of a, 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 a lesson um, uh, that, uh, you know, the, the underground edge can be, can be lost over time. And I think, I, I think that started to happen around, around this time. And other tools like John the Ripper were supporting uh, NT password hashes. And, you know, you had innovations like, um, 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 you know, rainbow tables getting implemented, and it, you know we're starting to fall behind here. But of course, I, this is an at stake product at this time. I'm not going to, I'm not going to complain. And I'm in control here. Uh, and then, um, so then LC5 comes out, and this was the last version that um, at stake came out with. Did did implement um, uh, rainbow tables, uh, packet sniffers now updated. Um, and adds remediation options. So you can crack your passwords, the things that crack really trivially, um, like with a dictionary attack, you can select them all, you can hit a button, and it will go out and uh, do password resets on, on, um, on uh, those accounts. So you can see it's sort of become an enterprise tool as opposed to just a pen tester tool. And then something, again, interesting happens. At stake, it's bought by Symantec. And uh, Symantec buys the, and I'm working at At Stake at the time, but I'm not, I'm not doing LC, LC5. Um, and uh, Symantec buys the whole company, so they get everything. They get the Loft brand name, they get LC5. Um, and um, after about um, nine months, I leave. I don't want to work at Symantec. Uh, it wasn't very interesting. They didn't want to do any of the ideas that I wanted to do. And, um, and uh, this really almost doomed Loftcrack, this transaction. I, I can't believe it sort of rose from the dead from this. But um, first interesting thing happened. Shortly after Symantec bought um, at stake, and Symantec kept selling and supporting LC5 um, until they could figure out that they didn't want to do that anymore. You know, big companies kind of work very slowly. Um, McAfee started flagging LC5 as a malicious tool. And I was like, this is just bizarre. Like, we've been around all these years, and all of a sudden, seven years later, uh, McAfee's flagging this as a malicious tool. Um, and so all our customers are complaining that they have to whitelist it, and they can't download it, they can't install it. Um, and I just thought it was really bizarre that it, it, once Symantec owned it, it became, so I don't know if there's a conspiracy theory there between McAfee and Symantec, but um, I, I did get that cleaned up. Uh, I, did, I did talk to people at McAfee, and I said, hey, this is a legitimate password auditing and recovery tool. Um, it's being sold by one of your main competitors, Symantec. You can't blacklist this. And they undid the blacklist. And I think we're like on some Uber whitelist now because I've never had the problem again. So. That, maybe that, that ended up turning up, turning up for, the, for the best. So then this is the dark days of Loftcrack, and this is probably when, or LC5, it probably went into obscurity for most people if they were even caring about it. Um, and uh, Symantec ended up end of lifing the product. They're like, you know, we don't agree with sort of offensive tools or tools that actually break things in order to secure them. That's not the Symantec ethos, right? Um, so they, uh, they, uh, they end of life it after a couple years. And so it's just sort of sitting there. 
and they own the technology and no one's doing anything with it. So we decided, hey, what if, you know, Mudge, Dildog, and myself, so what if we go to Symantec and say, you know, can we buy Loftcrack from you? You know, we don't, we, we, we think that we could, we could continue developing it. And, um, you know, they, they thought about it and they thought that, you know, it would be good if we bought it because we could sort of take the liability of all the customers that might complain to them that, you know, uh, you know they, they still want support and it would just be a clean way for them to just completely get rid of it. So we ended up buying it from them. So now it's come back to the loft. It sort of went into the corporate world and then popped back out again. So December 31st, 2008, um, Loftcrack is back, owned by me, uh, Dildog, and, and, and um, Mudge. And so we went to work, and in about three months, we came out with loft crack six. So it's back loft crack again, right? And then we have the sharp edges again on the saw. It's a, it's a, it's a dangerous tool. Uh, and, um, you know, it sort of got its mojo back. Um, and so we, 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 we've uh, been selling this now for five years. Um, and, you know, the big thing to do was just bring it up to date, support 64-bit uh, password hash uh, dumping. <coughs> And then we added um, Unix, um, Unix uh, hash support. So, you know, what do we do now, right? We have it back. Um, you know, people are, people, are, people are buying it. People still want to purchase uh, hack passwords. So, you know, I think the goal still is let's put all the tools for password auditing in one program, right? Let's, let's be able to grab the hashes, all the different ways that you can do it in one program, whether it's sniffing on the network or it's grabbing them from registries and files, um, um, have the enterprise tools there, um, importantly support all the modern CPUs and GPUs uh, that are out there, make it more than just Windows. Um, and one of the other goals is for us to include more of the security company, so this is community. So that's, uh, that, that's sort of what we're thinking about now and how we're thinking about uh, Loftcrack. There are some challenges. Um, you know, it's harder to extract hashes remotely now. There's a lot of firewalls. Uh, people are blocking SMB on the network. Um, there's remote UAC. Um, it's, it's, it's more difficult to do cleanly, um, cleanly now. Um, the sniffer is woefully out of date. It doesn't work with Windows 8 anymore. And you know GPUs are obviously very very important to uh, to uh, password cracking, and we want to we want to support them. But one of the things we've been realizing in some cases, um, you know, you can have a slow GPU and a fast CPU, and what do you do in in, the, in that situation? You don't want to just default to the GPU. So these are some of the so those are some of the goals, and these are some of the challenges we've been working on, and this all comes down to we're going to come out with Loftcrack Seven. So um, we think that there's plenty of more life uh, left in passwords. You know, we saw it take Microsoft 10 years to change their original scheme. Um, I think they're still going to have uh, NTLM passwords in 10 years. I think it'll still be there. So um, while I think two-factor authentication and things like that are great, I don't, I don't expect the world to move that quickly. And so we're making we're making a significant investment because we think this, there's still a lot of, of life um, in, in cracking password hashes. So this is a little uh, preview of Loftcrack 7. Um, we're in beta now. If you're really interested in trying it out, um, you can email us at support at loftcrack.com. Um, and uh, so what, what we've done is we've completely overhauled it. We've got 100% new code base. We got rid of MFC, which is very Windows-centric, and went to QT, so we can port this to Linux, and we can port it to Mac OS pretty easily. And we made the decision that um, the current cracking engines are so far ahead of, uh, of, of where we, we were at with this you know, four-year hiatus and then even longer, that um, that wasn't where we were going to get our, our, our key values. So we worked with Solar Designer and open wall and we're actually licensing the John the Ripper engine from, from uh, open wall 
um, and so we have a license to sell that um, in, in, uh, in Lothcrack, which is great because it gives us uh, good GPU support and actually really cool um, CPU support for all the latest uh, CPU instruction sets. Um, the other thing that we, we've done, which um, we think is probably more in the Lovecraft sweet spot, is you know grabbing remotely grabbing uh, password hashes. So we came up with a way of doing that um, over RDP uh, really cleanly because if you look at the way Windows networks are um, administrated these days, um, it's usually by uh, the remote desktop protocol. So people use that port. That port's open, so they'll firewall off everything else and they'll allow RDP through. So it's great to be able to uh, grab password hashes um, that way. So we get the uh, John the Ripper complex wordless rules. We're having full Unicode support. It's fully internationalized. Um, really good scheduling. Uh, so you can say, you know, you can write a schedule script with the GUI that just says, hey, go out and every month grab hashes from these 20 different machines and crack them this way and send me the report. Um, or reset, you know, reset weak password. So it's, it's fully, fully schedulable and, and, um, and automatable. And we've added full Unix support. So we kind of had some kind of broken Unix support before. Now we fully support Linux, Solaris, BSD, and AIX um, hashes. Um, and you can grab them over SSH. So if you have, uh, you know, if you, if you have your system set up that you can um, uh, have the permissions on an account to log in remotely to get at uh, the shadow file, um, you can do that um, remote, remotely um, by just, you know, setting it up in, in, the, uh, in, in, in the program and we, 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 uh, we store the credentials in Windows um, Credential Store. One of the cool features we've added is calibration. And what calibration does is it looks through all the different um, uh, CPU and GPU options that we can detect um, and all the different um, hash types um, that we have. And it runs a calibration to find the fastest way to, uh, to, to, to crack that password. And Dildog got very excited and he added the little flames if you get over one giga cracks per second. I don't know if that's animated or not because he just sent me this screenshot a few days ago and I'm like, I have to put that in, that's so cool. Um, so maybe it is animated. I think it actually is. Um, but yeah, you can see here that, um, you know, you're getting, you're getting uh, if, if GPU is supported, it's, uh, the GPU is probably going to be the fastest. I mean, he's got a really fast GPU there, you can see from the, from the cracking speed. Um, but you could have a slow, a slow GPU and a fast CPU, and then it would pick the CPU. And interestingly enough, you can see for some of the hash types that are not supported with John the Ripper on the GPU, um, that uh, the XOP um, uh, uh, extensions are the fastest. Um, and in some, it's the SE. I don't know why the SSE2 is the fastest. It must be some, some reason with the algorithm hasn't been updated uh, very well. Um, to use the other um, instructions, but uh, this is this is uh, this is a cool feature, and it's going to be even cooler because what we're going to support in the, in this version is completely pluggable API. So you could actually uh, plug in a different cracking algorithm um, in with the API. And we would cycle through that and see, hey, is this, we'll look at all the, all the, all the cracking algorithms that, are, that, are, that have been installed for this hash and choose the one that's the fastest. Um, so that is, uh, that, that, that's one of the goals, to try, to try to open up the ecosystem a little bit more. There's some really cool stuff going on in the open source community. You know, recently Hashcat has been open source. So someone could write a plugin um, for Hashcat using our API. And, and use Hashcat, and it would check John the Ripper versus Hashcat, and it would just, it would just select the fastest, um, the fastest algorithm. So trying to, try, trying to make a little bit of an ecosystem here. So uh, future directions, we definitely want to do uh, Mac OS X port. You know, I have, I, uh, I think a lot of people, um, uh, you know, use that as, as, a, as a laptop and if they're only doing, you know, dictionary hacking or something like that or, you know, I'd like to see how the GPUs are on, on, uh, on OS X. Um, so we want to try that. Um, 
And uh, we want to, we wanna, with our plugins, we want to be able to extract hashes from lots of different places, crack lots of different uh, password types. You know, we're, we're pretty much a small outfit. We're only three people, so we can't cover the whole universe. So we think with the plugin modules that uh, people could, you know, give them away. They could sell them. We, we, we don't care. We want to try to open up, um, op open that up a bit. So I think I'll just end it there and uh, save some time. Um, save, save some time um, for questions if anyone uh, has any. Yeah.